of uh, arbitrary error that, that sort of was committed in the course of historical development. They developed for a very specific and very serious reason. There is another ism, particularly in American tradition, individualism. Uh, I, I think that we have to kind of, uh, in my show, it would be helpful to begin to think about politics as an aggregate of social forces, not as the kind of uh, collection of uh, individual kind of uh, uh, moves. And in that sense, I think ideologies play an indispensable role. You know? People are going to think about what it is that needs to be done in different ways. These things need to be characterized, compact, succinct. The isms are not. Uh, again, they're, they're there for a reason. Well, I meant more as far as a social labeling of a group. It, an ism kind of creates a separatist type of thinking so that the, the commonality of all the goals of all the groups are separated for the sake of a lot more argument, you know what I mean? It takes the... When you label yourself as something, it means you've jumped on that bandwagon and you really don't have much use for any of the other isms that are out there. You know what I mean? So you, would you be in favor of reintegrating the 1% and making it up? No, just call it a commune. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? And then there's a commonality instead of an ism. Uh, yes, uh, the principle of solidarity has a long and noble tradition in, I hate to say, in the history of socialism. But the problem is that uh, solidarity needs to be grounded in a kind of sober and, and articulated uh, position. Exactly. So I think that before we can all converge onto a position, it would be very helpful to actually air out differences without sort of being too afraid of the fact that you might disagree. You might disagree. If the history of the Soviets and the Communists had uh, functioned in a way that there were massive and extremely sharp debates within these institutions, feelings might have gotten hurt. But that's not really the issue. The issue is to create solidarity on a higher plane a plane of political clarity and political unification. You know, there's an easy way to attain solidarity. Let's not talk about politics at all. Right. Then we're all the same. And then we're left with kind of a very shallow kind of, well, we have 1% and 99%. Not, not, not what do we do? Well, we could go to a city council. Uh, but there, I think if there are voices that insist that, look, that, that type of politics is bankrupt, it's likely to leave that end. These things should be hammered out, democratic, art. Through discussion. Yes. Whether it's heated or not. I agree. <laughs> Simple listening and coming up with a better alternative through collective thinking. <laughs> so that was that was my point. <laughs> States has an enormous and impressive actual history of class struggle 
from the, uh, you know, the, the massive strikes of the end of the 19th century to, uh, uh, to the, the, the enormous experience in the 1930s. And so if you're asking me, uh, in my judgment, the resurgence of a definite class consciousness for working people is the issue of the day. Uh, if, if that happens, we have a shot at transforming society. If that doesn't happen, and we're mired into all sorts of forms of nationalism, particularism, or very our individualism, then we're not going to. And, and, and so I think one of the things that would be valuable is actually to appreciate the extent to which American history itself is the product of a series of massive class confrontations in a certain sense the American Revolution first and foremost. You know, the country itself was formed on the basis of a massive uh, struggle between contending social groups. Uh, the civil war. Yeah. So that, that's what We have a point of clarification here and a question over the later. Yeah, I just want to add something to what you were saying, which is excellent. Um, John C. Calhoun who was the South's great political thinker before the Civil War, was actually preceded Marx in using class analysis to understand history. And Marx actually borrowed his ideas from John C. Calhoun in many ways. And um, that comes directly from American history, and that's an important thing to not forget in this discussion. I know. I, I just assume forget it. Yeah, no, I mean, I can see your face, but I mean, um, we should not forget that it, class analysis originally comes from the wealthy and powerful as a way of trying to understand and how better to maintain their power. And understanding their own analysis and flipping it so we can empower ourselves is a critical mode of analysis. Question. One last question. And, uh, well, this is not a question, this is a comment. And it, it relates to what you were saying it, it, on the question of class consciousness. Because A, there are classes in the society. B, there is one class that is very conscious of that, and that's the ruling class. And so, for example, you see Mitt Romney at the very outset of Occupy say, no, Occupy is class warfare. That was the words that he was using. And he's right. He's right. The problem is that we don't have the consciousness that the ruling class has. And by the way, neither do we have the organization that the ruling class has. And I mean, the question of how we get from here to the kinds of things that the professor was talking about, it seems to me, can actually be crystallized into those two issues. And they're related. How do we develop that class consciousness? And how do we develop the organizations of our class that are capable of actually transforming society? And I want to end um, by just announcing that, I mean, the professor spoke for quite a long time, so there wasn't a lot of time for discussion. But uh, I, I'm from another organization, the International Social